Our next area of genetics, lesson two, is on understanding inheritance. Remember what genetics is? The study of inheritance. It's the study of how traits are passed from parents to offspring. And heredity is the passing of traits from parents to offspring. And it all has to do with the big question, how are traits passed from parents to offspring? Here are some key concepts to uh, listen for and watch for as we go over this lesson. What determines the expression of traits? How can inheritance be modeled? And how do some patterns of inheritance differ from Mendel's model? Remember, Mem Mem blech, can't talk here. Mendel's model is the three concepts that he came up with. The concept of unit characteristics, the concept of dominant and recessive, and the concept of segregation. So Mendel, after his eight years of raising pea plants and pro producing the paper Mendelian Genetics, he concluded that two factors, we now call them genes, alleles, one from each parent is what controls each trait. And remember, he dealt with seven different traits of the pea plant, like flower color, pea pods if they're green or yellow, wrinkled or round peas. Mendel's factors are part of chromosomes. So that's where these genes are. Gene is actually a section of DNA, and in DNA is what makes up the chromosomes. And he realized they exist in pairs. We call those now homologous pairs of chromosomes. One chromosome from each parent. And each cell in an offspring organism contains chromosomes from both parents. Such as in a human, we get 23 chromosomes from our mom and 23 chromosomes from our dad. So we get 23 from each, from both parents or from each parent. Now we're going to go over some very important terms in this lesson that you need to have a thorough understanding of so that you'll understand when we get to working genetic problems and I use these terms you'll know what I'm talking about. So make sure that you thoroughly understand these. One is what a gene is. A gene is a section on a chromosome that has genetic information for one trait. So it's a section of DNA, a section on a chromosome, and it's genetic information for one trait, such as your eye color, whether you can roll your tongue or not, what kind of vision you have. Each one of those are separate genes. The different forms of a gene are called alleles. So let's go back to Mendel's flowers. So a gene for the pea plants that Mendel dealt with was, one of them, flower color. The alleles were purple flower color and white flower color. So the gene is flower color, the allele is the specific type of color. So alleles, different forms of a gene, are called alleles. Each chromosome has one allele for every gene on it, and they're located in the exact same place on the homologous pairs of chromosomes. So you got one allele from your mom and one allele for, from your dad for your ability to roll your tongue or not, for whether you have a cleft chin or not, and several other kinds of traits. The two chromosomes in an offspring cell may have different or same alleles, and we've got terms for that. The same allele would be when Mendel had a purple allele and a purple allele. The male purple and the female was purple. The different was when he crossed a purple flower with a white flower. So that was different alleles for the gene of flower color. Here's another example showing you about the allele. An allele is one member of a pair or series of different forms of a gene, the different forms of a trait that a gene may have. And on here it's showing you 
purple flower, and white flower. Notice how this is one pair of homologous chromosomes and the a place where the alleles are, where the particular gene is, is called the locus. So there's a certain locus for each gene. And the alleles are going to be at that same loci on the gene or the chromosome that came from the mom and the chromosome that came from the dad. An example is a gene for the blossom color in many species of a flower. A single gene controls the color of the petals, but there may be several different versions or alleles of the gene. One version might be in red petals, while another might result in white petals. The resulting color of an individual flower will depend on which two alleles it possesses for the gene flower color and how those two alleles interact. And that's the key part that we're going to be looking at. What if they get different genes from the parents? How do those two genes, excuse me, how do those two alleles react with each other? Here's another picture. This one is the one that's found in your book dealing with Mendel and the genes. Notice this is one pair of homologous chromosomes showing you at the top of one you have in the yellow colors, you have the gene for the stem, how long the stem is. Then underneath that, you have the different greens there, which is the gene for the pod color. I mean the pod, whether it's bumpy, which they call constricted or inflated. And then the last one in the red there is for the flower color. Now with this particular pair of homologous chromosomes, there are different alleles for the stem. One parent gave a short stem, the other parent gave a tall stem. There were different alleles for the pod, the pea pod. One parent gave a bumpy pea pod, which is the constricted, and the other gave the smooth pea pod, which is the inflated. And then they both gave the same allele for the flower color. Ah, excuse me, that's not flower color. That's where the flower is located, axle and axle. And axle means the flowers are on the side, not at the very top at the end. All right, some more very important genetic terms. You need to know what is phenotype and what is genotype. We will be using these terms a lot when we're working uh, genetic problems. Geneticists call how a trait appears or is expressed the traits phenotype and the two alleles that control the phenotype they are called the genotype so I always think of it this way phenotype is what is physically expressed in the organism what showed up in this particular trait and let's go back to Mendel and the flowers because we've been using that a lot if it uh, pre -pre excuse me, if it produced a purple flower, then the phenotype is purple. Now the genotype for a purple flower could be one of two things. It could be that each parent gave a, an allele for purple flower color. Or, as we looked at his second generation of crosses, where he took two purebreds and crossed them to get a hybrid, he knew that they had an allele for purple and an allele for white, but what physically expressed in the offspring was only purple. So the phenotype was purple, the genotype was a purple allele and a white allele. So over here you can see, and we're going to look at those terms, what homozygous and heterozygous means. And we're also going to look at whenever a geneticist or whenever a person is expressing the genotype and writing it on paper, we use letters of the alphabet. And we also use capitals and lowercase, and you'll learn why. So here's an example again of genotype. It's the genetic makeup or allele combinations. So on the traits that we are going to be dealing with, the genotype is going to have two letters because one allele from the male 
and one allele from the female. So that's going to be the genotype, too. When writing a genotype, the dominant trait, and we're going to talk about, remember, we did talk about that. That was in the last lesson. lesson. The dominant trait was the one that dominated, and it was the actual trait that expressed itself even though there was a recessive allele in it. And so the dominant trait, because it's the one that shows up, it's the one that is expressed, it's the one that is hiding the other trait, it is going to be given a capital letter. And whenever you have a recessive and a dominant trait, they always write the dominant trait first. So look at the two possible um, uh, genotypes here for a red flower. This is a red rose. The two capital R's would mean an allele for red from one parent and an allele from red from the other parent. Or another possibility could be they got an allele for red from one parent and they got an allele for white from the other parent, but the red is dominating, so it expressed itself. So scientists use uppercase and lowercase letters as symbols to represent the alleles that are in a genotype. Now phenotype for the rose is what color is the rose. The phenotype is the physical trait, the physical appearance, the visible trait, what showed up, what expressed itself. And what expressed itself in that rose is red, so you can see it. You can't see genotype, because that's the genes inside the chromosomes, inside the nuclei. But you can see phenotype because that's what you're physically looking at with the organism. Here's another example with corn, with purple grain corn and white grain corn. And the genotypes, the possibles, would be a gene for purple and a gene, excuse me, an allele for purple from mom and an allele for purple from the male or an allele for purple from one parent and the allele for white from another. And so the phenotypes are in every single one of these, look at the genotypes, they all have a capital G. Two capitals or one capital. As long as there's a capital G, what expresses itself? The dominant trait. So the phenotype of those genotypes, every single one of those uh, corn would be purple. They're purple grain. What would a white grain genotype look like? Two lowercase g's. No upper at all. There's two lowercase. And we don't have any in this particular offspring. Okay, here's those other important terms that I said we would get to, homozygous and heterozygous. When the alleles are the same, two capital letters or two lowercase letters, those are the same, the genotype is homozygous. Homo means the same, zygous throughout, so they're the same. Genes, alleles are the same, homozygous. It's also what we refer to, this is the actual more scientific name, homozygous, but you might want to write down in your notes that this is a purebred homozygous. That's the true breeding that we were talking about, the purebreds in the last lesson. Now, if the alleles are different, if you have a capital and a lowercase, then the genotype is heterozygous, Hetero means different. So homozygous would be two capitals or two lowercase. Heterozygous would be two, I mean one of each, capital and lowercase. Now what was the term used in the first lesson that really is heterozygous? Remember homozygous is a purebred, so a heterozygous is a hybrid. Homozygous, purebred, heterozygous, hybrid. Make sure you know those. Here's some examples. Homozygous purebred, an organism usually the result of many generations of such breeding, remember true breeding, both genes are the same. Having identical factors is what Mendel called it. 
but both genes, technically should say both alleles, are the same. And you can see two examples down there, two capital R's and two lowercase r's. And it, a lot of times it's what we refer to with um, certain animals as being thoroughbreds. They're purebreds. The key difference with a thoroughbred, they're talking about a bunch of genes, a bunch of traits. When we're referring to homozygous or heterozygous, we are referring to one trait at a time. So it's not like an organism is all homozygous or an organism is all heterozygous. No, I might be homozygous for my ability to roll my tongue. I might be heterozygous then for freckles. Heterozygous hybrid, an offspring that was given different genetic information for a trait from each parent. The alleles are different. Having factors that are different is how Mendel put it. Two different alleles for a trait. A hybrid is the result of a cross between two different homozygous, between a homozygous purple pea plant flower and a white flower. That gave the hybrid, which was purple. Now when we talk about a cross in genetics, we're not talking about the cross that Jesus died on. We're talking about a genetic cross, and they just simply refer to it as a cross. And it's a mating of organisms to test how they inherit traits. And it could be physically using organisms and experimenting or watching in a generation of pea plants like Mendel did, or it could be a hypothetical cross where we can say, you know, cross this particular organism trait with this one and see what are the probabilities. And, and geneticists do this all the time with human beings, talking about taking a cross and what if you have children and you would have the likelihood of having some of these um, diseases that can be inherited, especially if it runs in your family line. Of course, this is make-believe because this is aliens here, it looks like. So the phenotype is normal black-eyed, and then we've got the orange-eyed. So if black-eyed is normal, they're saying cross a black-eyed alien with a orange-eyed alien, and that would be the cross. And what you would use is the two letters. What two letters, what the genotype, what two alleles does that alien have to have black eyes? And what two alleles does that other alien have to have their orange eyes? When you do a cross, the generation, the possible genetic um, possibilities, or in reality, if it is a real cross, and you, well, how many offspring are produced, that first cross, the offspring are called the first filial generation interesting the word comes from a Latin word that means daughter and son so that's why they picked filial you need to know that when we use genetic problems we're only going to use the abbreviation for it and it's a capital F with a sub one so it's not an exponent it's down below instead of up and the definition is the first generation of offspring of a genetic cross and this is actually a pedigree chart showing you the parents at the top and then it says children and then it has who those children married so the children would be the first filial generation just like you and if you have brothers or sisters you and your siblings are the first filial generation of your parents now notice if you follow the pedigree chart when they marry, they have children as well, so that's the grandchildren of the parents. And the grandchildren would be the second filial generation. And then the great-grandchildren would be the third filial generation. On and on and on. And you can go. And a good example with you, your parents are the first filial generation of their parents, which are your grandparents, and you would be the second filial generation of the grandparents. And if you have children, that would be the third generation of the grandparents.
Or, again, you're the first generation of your parents, and your kids would be the second generation of your parents. Second filial, first filial, all the way up to whatever generation you want to go.